Firmitid snails are a family of sessile gastropods that are frequently found in our saltwater aquariums. They are often mistaken for worms, but they are in fact snails that spend their adult life in one location and filter feed by sending out a mucus web to catch organic debris. In this video, I'm going to go over why vermitted snails can be a problem and several things that you can do about them. Let's start at the beginning. Why are vermitted snails a problem at all? They are a bit of a nuisance in the home aquarium for a number of reasons. First off, the mucus webs that they broadcast can bother nearby corals and other inverts. In general, coral don't like to be touched by anything. Physically contacting the webs alone can be a source of aggravation. Having said that, there is some speculation that the mucus webs are not just a physical irritant, but might have pre-digestive enzymes that could actively be killing coral. Everything is fighting for real estate on the reef. It makes sense that vermitted snails would have some mechanism to clear out neighboring organisms. Secondly, they can be a nuisance to you when you are performing regular maintenance in your tank. Vermitids grow a thick spiral base that tapers into what amounts to this pokey tube at the top. It is very common to be scrubbing your tank and bump into one of these tubes, hurt your hand, or let's say you're grabbing a piece of the aquascape and it ends up puncturing your finger. This happens all the time, and the fun really begins if your hand gets infected. Third, they are one of the most prolific hitchhikers. If they find their habitat agreeable, they can explode in number by broadcast spawning. A small number of snails initially can balloon into the thousands in a relatively short period of time. Once they do that, their population becomes much more difficult to control. Fourth problem, they can be difficult to eradicate from a system. They are well suited to beat dipping and quarantining procedures, and once established in your system, they can persist in overflow boxes or inside your plumbing for years on end. And one day, if the conditions are right, and frankly, they're almost always right for these guys, they can broadcast spawn again and repopulate your display tank. Now that we've covered just a little bit of background information on these snails, let's talk about how to control this problem. I say control because it's near impossible to a, prevent their introduction, and B, to fully eradicate them from a system long term. You can, however, get to a point where they are essentially a non-issue. I've laid out five treatments that can help tremendously in that regard. Now, these treatments are not mutually exclusive, and they work well in tandem with one another for maximum benefit. Number one, if you are of the belief that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, Quarantining new arrivals is a really good idea. So long as your quarantine skills are up to par and you're not killing fish and coral, quarantine is a very good practice that can minimize a lot of headaches down the road. Now, I have to say up front that it's important to have realistic expectations with quarantine though. I think hobbyists throw down that term like it's this magical cure for everything. And theoretically it should be, but in practice it is not. Many pests Vermitids in particular are very, very capable organisms. They have microscopic larvae and eggs that have a funny way of infiltrating our tanks. We have had them show up in systems where we were conducting 72-day quarantines. We've even had them show up in fish quarantine systems that have never been exposed to a single piece of live rock or coral. We're talking about only plastic plants and PVC pipe, yet there they were. I will never, ever discourage anyone from setting up a quarantine system. Quite the opposite. Even preventing a single problem makes the whole effort worthwhile. But again, if the expectation is for the quarantine to be this hard stop filter to completely eliminate all your problems, you will likely be disappointed. The eggs and the snails themselves all but ignore all efforts to dip them. Eggs by their very nature are resistant to almost everything and the snails can just close up for days if necessary to bypass any dipping procedure. Full exclusion should not be the point. There are degrees to due diligence, and they are all impactful. Addressing a problem at the early stages is very different than trying to address the problem at late stages. If a rock, 
coral or frag is covered with the snails, try to handle that problem in a quarantine system, not in your display tank. Second treatment. Fermitted snails are filter feeders, and the next two techniques are meant to limit their feeding opportunities. You obviously still need to feed your tank, so here are some ideas on how to do that more cleanly. The first thing is if you're broadcast feeding your tank powdered plankton foods or even liquid foods, it is feeding into the problem. Vermitted snails will turbocharge their reproductive cycle if fed aggressively, so the first step is to stop broadcast feeding coral foods into the tank. I like powdered plankton foods as much as the next person, but if you're dealing with an outbreak of vermitids, it's time to stop all that. Again, this is coming from a guy that loves feeding coral. I'm a big advocate for feeding, but you gotta pump the brakes on all of that until the snail population is under control. Your corals will be just fine for a long time if you stop feeding them. Many people never feed their corals after all. Think of it this way. Feeding corals is all about optimum color and growth. But guys, so long as you're dealing with an outbreak, you can't optimize anything. So that's the first thing. Stop with the broadcast feeding. Second thing is to rinse your frozen foods. We make our own blend of frozen food here, which consists of a mix of mysis shrimp, Pacific plankton, sometimes krill. We rinse it all out before we portion it into four ounce feeding containers. But even after that, it's still a very messy food. So when we later thaw out that four ounce feeding container and we go to feed our tanks, we give it another rinse. And it's amazing how much of the fines still come off of that food. We've already pre-rinsed it, but we rinse it again. Third, feed your fish smaller portions that are more likely to be consumed quickly. Doing this gives filter feeders less opportunity to eat. The fish will clear up the water fast, and even if some of the food gets caught in the mucus webs, lots of fish have no problems picking it right off of there. Essentially, they're stealing food from the snails. If you insist on feeding coral, it's still fine, you can, but go about target feeding them more carefully and leave the flow off a little bit longer to make sure as much food as possible ends up inside the coral and not in the water column that can later be trapped by one of their mucus webs. Those three tips that we just talked about are about addressing limiting food input into your water at the feeding stage. Believe it or not, if you do just this and nothing else, your vermitted snow population long-term will be much less of an issue. But let's continue because like I said, a lot of these strategies are synergistic. As we mentioned before, for probably the fifth time now, vermitted snails are filter feeders. So the plan now is to out-filter feed the filter feeders. We accomplish this by using a number of different mechanical and chemical filters to polish the water and make it a nutrient desert for these snails. The first filter that I can recommend is a pleated micron filter of some sort. For smaller tanks, say less than 100 gallons, you can try this marine land magnum polishing filter. It contains a white pleated filter that does a good job of trapping all kinds of particulates. If you use this filter for a few hours per day and then rinse out the filter when you're done, it will do a really good job over the long term. For larger tanks, you can use several of these or invest in a larger filter like a new clear canister filter. But the setup of those filters is a little bit more involved. The maintenance on those is a little bit more involved. I prefer using several of these smaller marine land filters because they're basically a small powerhead with a pleated micron filter attached. They are also a very versatile little filter for lots of other applications, like if you're doing just regular tank maintenance and kicking up a lot of detritus, it'll help quickly polish up that water. Having said that, I wish some company would make a larger, more powerful version of this, but for right now, this is basically it. In that same line of thinking, if you have a sump, you can use a filter sock or a filter roller to more aggressively capture particulate matter. We have some sumps with filter socks and some sumps without. Needless to say, we can tell which ones stay cleaner. Sure, these filter socks are gross to keep laundered, but they work. During restock, this is a total aside, we happened upon a company called Rocky Mountain Fish Filters, and they had a really interesting filter sock alternative. It's essentially a stack of plastic discs, 
and these discs have small channels of different sizes. They had a 100 micron and a 200 micron disc. The cool thing is you could just unscrew the spine of the stack and it loosens all the discs up. And from there, it takes 10 seconds to rinse out all the debris compared to a filter sock that you have to soak in bleach and put through the laundry machine, all that stuff. You just unscrew the stack, rinse it, screw it back down tight, and then you have essentially your fresh 100 micron filter sock again. They're still developing different sizes, and I'm waiting for the seven inch models for my sumps because that would save a ton of time cleaning and I don't have to deal with that gross to try to smell in my laundry. Anyhow, you get the idea. Filtering your overflow water is another very useful technique to eliminate excess food in the water column. Third water polishing technique you can do is to aggressively wet skim your tank. When you dial up your skimmer to pull out nearly clear liquid, it's kind of like doing a water change of sorts, but it is stripping out dissolved organics and bacteria. From what I understand, a lot of your skimmate in the collection cup, that brown stuff, is bacteria. There's a lot of literature out there regarding bacteria as a food source for corals and other inverts, and it might be a similar story with these ruminant snails. If you decide to do this method, make sure to clean out your skimmer neck and head before cranking up that skimmer. If the head and neck is dirty, it's going to get flushed back into the tank. You would think that the skimmer would skim that out first, but in practice, that's not what happens. So clean first, then wet skim. I will throw a fourth thing into this mix that you can experiment with on your own. I have never done this personally, so take that for what it's worth, but there are calcium carbonate powder additives that you can use in your tank. They cloud your water temporarily, and in that process, they bind up all kinds of stuff in the water, and then they settle out over time. By doing this clouding, it polishes your water. I've heard a lot of anecdotes that doing this powder treatment a few times will help clean out your water to such a degree that almost all of those particulates that are in the water get eliminated, and essentially that limits the food source further for these remitted snails. All right. Now that we've gone over a bunch of ways to starve the snails out, let's now talk about physically removing the snails that you have. You can absolutely get in there with bone cutters and remove them by hand. This requires persistence and generally works in smaller tanks with smaller populations. Once you have a proliferation of remitteds in larger tanks, it can get a little bit out of hand, but I've seen people be really diligent about removing them, and even in larger tanks, they get in there and they make a difference. What I like to do is to first handle the flat, easy surfaces. I get in there with a siphon hose, and I use the tip like an eraser. I dislodge them from the tank, and as I siphon, it clears off all of those flat surfaces. So mainly, that's the tank glass, that's the seams, the overflow box, things like that. As for the rocks and the aquascape, you can use bone cutters, but there are going to be these nooks and crannies that you won't be able to access easily. Another option if you don't want to use bone cutters is you could glue or putty over them. It's probably something for smaller tanks that might work well. It's not something that I would personally do at scale, but again, your mileage may vary. If the vermitted snail population is completely excessive on the rocks, you might want to consider removing sections of the aquascape and just leaving it out in the sun for a few weeks to kill everything off in mass. We've had to reset a few rocks here and there. We let the rocks bake in the sun for a while, we hose them off, scrub them really, really carefully, and then reintroduce them to the system. It takes a little while for them to regrow coralline, but the vermidids are no more. This is a way to deal with the problem in bulk rather than individual snails by hand. The fifth and final treatment suggestion that we can offer is to introduce natural predators of remitted snails. I only know of one that does the trick, and it is an imperfect predator to say the least. They are bumblebee snails. Bumblebee snails are a carnivorous snail that really likes to eat other snails and mollusks. It is hard to see them in the act of eating vermitids, but I can tell that over time, the population of vermitted snails decreases in the tanks where we've added a few dozen of these bumblebees. 
The problem is bumblebee snails will eat your other snails, so that is something to consider before adding them. They might also eat your clams if you have any. Like I said, they're not perfect, but they have worked out well for us. The nice thing about a predator is that they are working constantly to bring down the population of whatever pest that they're targeting. The key is to introduce enough of them to get the job done, but not so many that they're just going to wipe out all of your other snails. I wish that there was a fish or something that was a much more selective predator of remitteds, but unfortunately, there isn't one that I know of. For now, these bumblebees seem to be the best solution, even considering their drawbacks. We have them in almost every tank. All right, guys, in conclusion, there are several different techniques that you have at your disposal to manage vermitted snails. These treatments work well in conjunction with one another. And if you can find a mix that you can perform reliably and sustainably, your vermitted snail issues will be largely minimized. Hope this video was helpful for you guys. And until next time, happy reefing.